In my personal life, Harley represents total freedom to me. Okay, I mean, fuck the laws, fuck the rules. You know, I have as much freedom as I'm willing to risk. Well, the computer and my hacker life represents that type of freedom, the same type of freedom exactly, but, you know, on a computer. It's just, uh, you know, whether people are called bikers or whether they're called hackers, it's the same type of freedom we're talking about. Hacking is simply hacking away at a computer keyboard until it does what you want it to do. That's all, nothing more or less. You can hack out a letter to Aunt Millie. It's just hacking away to do what you want it to do. The press has usurped our rightful title and handed it off to these 14-year-old twerps who crack into computer systems, and that bothers me. A hacker is somebody who comes up with this really elegant line of code that fixes your problem. You know, ha hackers are a natural resource. They come from Ohio. You know, Orville and Wilbur Wright, the original hackers, you know, bicycle guys. And he just does it like, you know, like that off the top of his head, basically. You never went in there trying to harm somebody else's system. It was all about the wall and getting through the wall and, and figuring out creative ways under, around, through, whatever. So that the spirit to be able to, to take these components, put technology that was the domain of governments for so long, and let the average person figure out how to use it, I mean, that's the, the promise of technology. BBSs were just the way to meet other hackers. That was the main point. And then you kind of run into that when you're doing the BBS thing. There's like strata. And there's like all this happy fun and that. And then there's the other thing. And so you kind of weasel around. You find interesting stuff. And I'm, I'm meeting people who are saying, oh, you want to learn about this? Here, here's some information. Here's a manual. Go to the telco. Ask them this question. They'll tell you. They'll answer your question. They'll give you information. It was just so exciting that there's this, yeah, that's funny. There's like this underground of stuff going on and people hacking stuff and messing with things that the other mags weren't talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really exciting to see that. And the gears started turning, you know a way to meet other people so you can learn about the system you're trying to hack, you know, and download text files, download frac, read about the system, you, you know, you found scanning. And that feeds the whole information drive. You just, you start craving, it's like a drug. I pretty much stopped calling anything that didn't have to do with the computer underground in one sense or another. Didn't have time for it, wasn't interested in it. Uh, to stop dealing with it at all. You basically knew by connecting to the board bef before anything happened, just how you're logging into the board, what they have to offer. You know, you can tell just by what BBS software they're running. Certainly there was an aspect of the, of the well, we're a bunch of pirates and they're a bunch of straights and la la la, but it was just more like, God, these people are boring. You know, you'd have to fill out a little essay about yourself and answer a bunch of questions. And what got me is that I could have got a credit card with less information than these BBS would want just to give me, you know, download access. You had to fill out a form and you had to like, 
you know, you'd have to send it back to Sysop, then you have to give him his email, and people get scared about giving the Sysop the email. I believe the popular phrasing was, are you a cop? Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't sure if the Sysop was a fed or not. And then they would, you know, they would get the email. Then they would have to do a callback verification to make sure your number is in place. So I'm serious, dude. This is how it worked. It was a painful process. I mean, there's tons of people all the time, you know, you'd see trying to apply to bulletin boards when you go through the New Year's voting process. That would somehow just stumble across an elite BBS phone number. And everybody would, you know, that was the greatest for laughs because you get to vote on them and put comments and be like, how the hell did this guy find this bulletin board phone number? You know? I thought I was the shit and then find out, no, I was nothing. <laughs> I mean, they would ask everything. They'd ask if you knew what all these abbreviations stood for and, uh, you know, how long have you been part? What's your newest, what's your newest game? That was always my big one, getting into other bullet boards. There was always a question that said, what's your newest piece of pirated software? So I would always just make up the name of a game. I'd be like, Bernie Johnson's Truck Rally 5. And then people would always be like, damn, like, wow, that's really just so new, I've never even heard of it. A lot of pirate boards had, were designed to look like some obscure system, like an old Unix system or whatever. And then once you log in, you know, you get the pirate board. Sometimes there's special passwords to get in. We had a public arena, and most people thought that's all we had. And then there were back rooms and back levels and sub-levels and so on. So I had, if you first logged on, you were a peasant. And maybe if you got a little more access, uh, I can't recall, you were given a, a classic card or a silver card or a platinum card, different, <laughs> different ways to go up the social scale. And when you did, you got access to more games or better discussion boards, places where people wouldn't be necessarily tolerant of people coming in there and flame baiting people and yelling at people or being very immature. Or even higher than that would be the more nefarious areas, pirating, hacking, freaking. You know, we wouldn't just say, take anyone's word for it. We ain't know, I know you have elite. I don't know what you're talking about, you know. As a sysop, I get emailed all the time. You know, they want, people want access to my elite section, elite this, elite that. And um, I never had one. I was always, I was actually always very paranoid about having one. Especially once I was like past 17, when I was 18 years old, I'm like, all right, now I'm really like, this is major reason not to have one. I think the best application forms written were by the humble guys. <laughs> Do you have a girlfriend and is she gonna get in the way? <laughs> you know? <laughs> the whole elite thing wasn't a conscious thing or, or a stated thing. And oftentimes I would downplay it or not discuss it crossing from one network to the other because it, it, it people get weird about it right or they I'm gonna spend all my time helping this person find a way into that network and it's, a lot of times it just didn't work out so I don't think I ever actually you know, nah, 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 I, you know. <laughs> well handles gives you a, a sense of anonymity and besides every third user is named Bob And you can't have more than one Bob. You can have Bob 2, Bob 3, or Curly Bob, or Bob's your uncle, or, you know, a cool name. Handles. Like, I remember having to consciously alter my mind when talking to my normal friends, like, about what a handle was and everything else. You know, the first time I logged on a bulletin board, I was naive, and I used my real I'm name, branded. you know? Yeah. And then the second time, once you see that people have a name, you, you pick something out. Right. And he came up with Sid Vicious. Which was extremely creative, as you right. can imagine. Yeah. And <laughs> that, mind you, I don't think that, I know I didn't know who Sid Vicious was when he came up with the Sid Vicious I name. probably didn't know who Sid Vicious was yeah. when I came up with it. And then <laughs> I saw it in the news or something. And then I came up with graphic violence again because I figured there was a, a move on. That, There's too much graphic violence on television. So I said, oh, okay, we'll, we'll have graphic violence then because it gave you a sense of being something cooler and much more independent than you normally would ever be for, you know, a 10 or 12 year old boy growing up in suburbia. I went by the alias The Almighty Set. <laughs> Named after an Egyptian god. Um. 
I was always Pud. I was Pud, Desperado, and Cannibal. I sort of flipped between the three. I was actually Pud when I was being a sysop, but I was Cannibal and Desperado a lot of times when I was on other bulletin boards because I, I wanted to anonymously see what people were saying about me and my board without them knowing that I was there. For me, when I started, I remember when I started using the handle count zero, and this was before there were a billion people using the handle count zero. I was the only person that I knew of who was using it. And this was right after the, right as soon as the book came out, you know, before it was a paperback. I mean, it was... And so being a 13 or 15 year old kid, or whatever I was at that time, I looked up at my wall and I saw a poster of Star Trek, or actually I think it was uh, a printout of ASCII art of uh, Klingon North Bird and uh, the Enterprise, and I just said James T. Kirk. And then whenever you would log on to a board, it would ask you for your handle and then your real name. I always would use, in the book, Count Zero, the real, the character Count Zero's real name is Bobby Newmark, so it always registers Bobby Newmark, too, so. I thought once I'd established my name, I couldn't change it. <laughs> I didn't know, I had no idea. I mean, the easiest way to stamp yourself as a newbie back then was to have one of about five or ten different things in your name, right? You know, Lord or God or um, the Great, you know, or Ninja or, you know what I mean? <laughs> Occasionally you'd get into these little uh, wars where, you know, somebody would steal your name across the country and you're like, well, we had it first and we have the files to prove it, you know? <laughs> and so usually they'd say, all right, fine, we'll just pick a different name. It was something we picked in the garage today, you know, whatever. I remember getting a phone call one time because the first time uh, I started calling, calling out, I had no idea what to call myself. It was just like, I'm going to call out. And I ended up using a handle sniper. Don't ask me why. I can't explain it. It just came up a sniper. And I remember getting a phone call from someone uh, on like a three-way phone call. And like a month down the road, I haven't been doing it very long. You know, you got to change your handle, man. I've had that for a long time. And people have started to confuse us. And this whole little pe people trying to bully me to change my handle and all this stuff. And the funniest thing was is, uh, I remember thinking about it and going, hey, screw you guys, I'm not fucking changing my handle for you. I could care less, you know? And eventually I thought it was lame anyways and, and changed my handle to Zealot. You know, initially it was sort of a fun thing, but having a handle, but I really took it to heart. And as, as over time, I had so many conversations using my handle as my name. And I felt the same way with all these other people I was talking to daily, you know. Uh, Brian Oblivion, Omega, White Knight, um, Golgo 13, Magic Man, Darby Crash, you know, they really became like real, real names to me. And when I learned their, quote, real names, um, I didn't feel like I had to switch to one or the other. I would use them both sort of interchangeably. And so, um, and it's funny now to this day, like whenever I hear anybody say, just like the number zero, someone says zero. What? Did someone say my name? I think a lot of people are not happy with who they are, or they may think that their lives are really not very interesting, which for most of us, that's not true. We all lead rather interesting lives. Uh, and if somebody wants to use a handle, more power to them. During the process of hacking, we should never destroy anything. Explore to learn all the kinkiest technology. Modify stuff and make your own. Learn how to do everything. Especially the dark side stuff, learn that first, okay? But don't implement it. It's like, yes, you could have a rifle here and you could be the best marksman in the world, but it doesn't mean that you have to shoot somebody. Freaking means a lot of different things. Freaking basically covers the whole spectrum of uh, fun with with Ma Bell, fun with the phone company, different things you can do. And and people will say that a lot of different things fall into the freaking category, which could be everything from uh, you know something as stupid as stealing somebody's uh, calling card number to something like uh, you know getting change out of a payphone. I mean, there's a lot of different categories. Long distance calling back then it was expensive. You know, and people today don't have any feeling for 
how expensive it actually was to pick up the phone, especially when you're trying to transfer 16K of data at 300 baud. Uh, it was a sizable chunk of change each month. And I was calling all over the country making long distance calls. You know, the, the phone bill that showed up one month was about that thick and my mother just about had a heart attack. And I had to go get a summer job to pay the phone bill off. My parents flipped out. They were, they were basically uh, they were like, what the hell are you doing up there? But uh, Do you remember how much that bill was for? Uh, $350. The next one was 500 And uh, at that point my parents were like, well, you've got to get these bills down. Well, so you know, that's where the freaking came in. <laughs> There's no way you're going to pay for that. <laughs> You couldn't afford it, and if you're doing it legit on your parents' line, I mean, they're going to kill you next month. So I think a lot of uh, a lot of the things about, as far as uh, people phone freaking, at least uh, that we're in the computer scene, was really to get access um, to BBS content, and you know, it was typically long distance. What am I going to do? Well, I can't stop calling these places. I just have to figure out how to do it for free. All right, so you'd get the one eight hundred numbers and the access codes and. <clears throat> So you get you a phone scanner, you'd run it all day while you're at school or something. And the whole point of the program was it had to try every code, then get a code, dial the Sprint number, wait whatever seconds, and input the stolen Sprint uh, code, and then dial CompuServe. If it got a carrier, boom, that went on your printer the next morning. So you'd go to sleep, the next morning you wake up, you had two or three Sprint uh, codes. You come home, you have a couple codes, whatever. You have to do that every month. You have to have fresh codes, very important. And you had a choice, either you kept it to yourself, which was the best thing to do, because you might have gotten 30 days of good long distance dialing on, out of it, or you traded it on a message board, on, on a bulletin board, to get high-end access to their, to their pirate games. And that code usually within three or four days, maybe, maybe a week, would be dead, because by the time you gave it out, 10 people gave it out to 10 more people, gave it out to 100 more people, before you know it, it was across the entire United States, out into Europe, out into everywhere, out to every single uh, uh, BBS out there. And of course, you know, that set off the red flag with Sprint or MCI or whoever it was. I used to stand at payphones in my high school and punch up numbers all day until I got a code. I got that tone and hey, I could call New York City. And, and, and the motivation of the kids isn't ever to screw the company. It's more, well, I need this. You know, I need this and what am I going to do? What am I, you know, like, what is it really an option that I would sit there and pay this, you know, 17 times my allowance for this week to make this one phone call out to talk to this one person that I met in California? No. We know we did something wrong. We were clearly stealing. But at the time, we're kids and you just don't think that it's wrong. You don't connect. And so we were going, well, we're just using this from... We're using a code that belongs to a large corporation. They won't even notice. Oh, they probably yeah, have it's this not happen stealing all the time. if you steal from right. the it's, large It's okay company. to steal from the large companies. Suddenly, I discovered I don't need to pay for my phone calls to call these BBSs. Now, I can dial a 950, punch in a couple of digits here. I'm calling long distance. I'm saving money. And, and the things we were doing with it were just merely promoting. We were connecting. We, you know, how do we connect with somebody in Austin? I'm not going to pay $6 an hour to connect to somebody in Austin. I'll just, you know, can I do that take free? a little bit out of my ethics here and use a free code. My parents, the next month, I remember my dad was like, so we have no long distance charges this month, but you're still using the computer just as much as you were last month. What's going on? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I'm just being a good boy. Oh, Sonny, I always remember Oh, Sonny. Oh, Sonny. Uh, it was a freak bulletin board up in uh, New York. It was spurred by a meeting of the Ohio Scientific Users Group of New York, which is what OSUNI stands for. Ohio Scientific it was a company that, that made computers. I had one, and we decided it would be great to have a BBS for the users group. Turned out no one else in the Ohio Scientific group really had a modem, so they didn't call up, but other people called up and um, some hackers um, kind of started to put some information on there, phone freaks mainly. It seemed like every freak in the nation was on this thing. I mean, to dial into it would, it would take you hours just redialing, redialing, redialing to get into it. There were a couple of people early on, um, Milo phone bill and Tom Tone, um, 
They were a couple of the early ones, and Mr. America also. Um, if you had any question, you posted it, and anywhere between an hour later to three days later, you know, depending on whatever person dialed in, you'd have the right answer. When someone would write something up, um, we would post it there, and that's how we got things like the black box and the blue box and um, uh, tips on phone freaking and um, various people who were really involved with the BBS, they'd write stuff. And it was a great forum to exchange that information. Anyone who called up could access it. I think what was interesting being on Arsuni at the time was the uh, Newsweek article. Um, it, it came out and there was the name of a board that you're on almost every day mentioned in, in Newsweek in, as a young teenager. It was just shocking. It was pretty amazing um, that this guy wanted to, to write things like this. Oh yeah, big adventure factor there. I'm an anarchist, look at me. What is it you're doing to promote anarchy? I'm an anarchist, look at me. That's all we were. It wasn't any actual plan, strategy, or anything to overthrow the government. It was just, that was the thing you did. You know, like people today getting their nose pierced. We were anarchists, right. but it didn't mean anything. The, the younger people at the time were like really into the anarchy stuff and they were all under 18 and they were, you know, they were still indestructible. They were still willing to go out and do the crazy things in real life. And the rest of us were doing those kinds of crazy things, but kind of worried about it more than they were. Uh, if you're 15 and you just learn how to write and you just learn how to publish to a global audience in the same month, you end up writing a lot of embarrassing stuff you can't retract. It sort of belongs to the world. It never occurred to us not to write about something unless we were pretty sure we were going to get busted. Um, but we were lonely kids, lonely, lonely teenagers. Some of us were lonely adults, um, or isolated for whatever reason. There were a lot of people in smaller communities who, who didn't have anybody else to talk to. I made a pipe bomb or two in my day. That was a big. That was a popular one. You know, well, who else would we tell about it? Sometimes you go out and do something particularly crazy just so you could tell people about it. At the time, there was th this book, the Anarchist Cookbook, <laughs> which was. <laughs> you know, banned, and so we appreciated that it was a banned book. And so we, our goal was to take as much of the Anarchist Cookbook as we could, put it in electronic form without plagiarizing. I mean, yeah. you, wanna, you wanna write fiction, you wanna write yeah. about uh, making bombs, mm -hmm. or uh, just being silly. Yeah, messing up with novels. But uh, <laughs> the urine box plans. We were also just into mischief, so <laughs> anything that we could think of that was mischief, we would write a text file about it. Uh, but you do it because uh, you're, you're, I guess, for the same reason people, uh, teenagers hang out in clumps or uh, uh, people form companies. You know, you're just hanging out with your friends. It was the first time any, any of us at that age had any way to publish anything that other people could read. Yeah, they had text files that were written, and they talk, it's funny, these text files are written by other junior high kids. And they talk about stuff at their school. It'd be like some school in California. Which is strangely familiar to you know our goofy stuff. It's like there's no way you you make those connections before. Like this is a new new thing. The early days was very exciting. And I guess, I guess in retrospect, that improved all of our English skills. Yeah, at this, you know? <laughs> you, I'm sure you recall the Columbine incident, right? Right. And whenever that happened, I was at work, and I'm talking with some friends, and they're they're like. How could they not see that there's this group of teenagers walking around in black trench coats, talking about explosives, toting guns? How can they not see that this is a problem? And, you know, this isn't that long ago. And I was completely stunned because I thought everybody did that. I had a trench coat. I made explosives. I played with guns on the weekend. I didn't have any hate. And I think that was the thing that separated us. Is, I, right. You know, I didn't hate anybody. I didn't hate my schoolmates. I didn't hate anybody. But we made explosives. We shot guns on the weekends. We had our black trench coats. We were had t-shirts with anarchy on them. We were all of that, that stuff there, all the things that the Columbine kids were, except that we didn't have any hatred. But it was a real eye-opener to think, you mean y'all, you know, my friends didn't, at work, you mean y'all didn't do this? And they're like, no, no. <laughs> you did? And I said, uh, 
maybe. No, not, Hold on. not me. I, I need to separate myself here and let me think about this before I answer the question. So. I bought a game for my computer that wouldn't run. And I called the manufacturer, and the manufacturer said, I'm sorry, that copy protection obviously apparently doesn't work right with that computer. So I took the software back, and they said, I'm sorry, you've opened the package. So we got together, <laughs> and we cracked the protection so that I could play the game on the computer that they told me it would run on. But see, there were other people out there cracking programs before us. We weren't the first. We just ended up being the best. You just, yeah, yeah, you think? Uh, it was such a, a challenge all the time, you know, get the new software, go in, crack it. I mean, I, my head was stuck in coding all the time, you know. I was thinking, you know, zeros and ones and hexadecimal and, you know, opcodes, operands, and all that stuff. I would nonstop. Back then, the language of choice for the platform, because they were so slow, was assembly and machine language. So it was difficult to learn, but once you learned it, reading it was. You know, straightforward, really. I picked it up so quickly, just with, with Assembler and all that, and I was able to write all kinds of, you know, cool routines and programs, and, you know, then getting on the BBSs, and... Now, at first it was just, you know, oh, well, there's a new game out, well, there's a cracked version, there's a non-cracked version. Well, how do you crack them? Well, you open up the, the manual on machine language on Apple II, and then find there's three others on the market, and then you read about this thing on somebody's bulletin board, and next thing you know, you're sort of an amateur. It started with uh, just neighborhood kids bringing me software, you know, the regular retail box software from the store. Then I'd crack it. A lot of people knew how to copy software, yeah, yeah, but not yeah. a lot of people knew how to actually crack it. And you had a lot of people in town that could actually crack it. If you could crack it, then everybody called you bored because you were the first to have it. And so it just, it just kept growing and growing that way. I think that's how I saw it. I can't recall anything other than maybe a couple of games being all that challenging. Um, although I know the, the software manufacturers spent an enormous amount of time and resources trying to copy protect this stuff, but uh, to no avail. It really, for us, it was getting the game as fast as we possibly could, if that meant overnighting the game from, you know, Datasoft or Broderbund or whatever. We would do that, and then when we'd get it, we'd have it cracked by morning. You know, that was our thing. You know. And then we could post on our bulletin board that we had the game. And that was, if you could do that, you were first to town, you were, you were the king of the hill. That was the whole deal. Serious competition developed between different groups. These groups would compete with each other, and then with me as an individual, um, in getting out, you know, these new wares. And who can get it out first? Because ultimately, whoever got it out first, their version and their name, by extension, would be the one that dominated. And if somebody else tried to trade their later crack into the system, it would simply be overwhelmed by the avalanche of whoever got it out first. They started the uh, avalanche. We're using adult words now, but we were proud of the brand we were creating. I mean, that was a large part of it, too. It was oh, MPG was, the, was a brand, that's for sure. Yeah, we didn't I mean, call that was, it that back then, but yeah, it was a brand. It's the best way to describe it. It was something that we were contributing towards and trying to build fame on. It I was, mean, the, the real sense of the word brand is you brand your horse, you know, with a stick. Yeah. We were branding those wares with our logo, you yeah, know. Trying to create an identity. Yep. Yeah. He didn't care about the game so much anymore. It was more about being first. Competition. Yeah. Classic hacking mentality race. Yep. Yeah. They were literally hungry. Literally, I mean, if somebody heard or knew that I had a you know, new program I was working to crack, I was working on it, they knew. I, and I'd get calls nonstop. Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? You know, can it go? And then it would just explode. It would go onto the BBSs for the, in the download area. It would get traded right and left and absolutely everywhere. We got a game. It was Buck Rogers. Remember when Buck Rogers, the TV show, came out? Mm -hmm. So right after that, there was an Apple II game called Buck Rogers. We got the game and John was cracking it and in the code was a message. If you're trying to crack this game, call this phone number. And, it, and it, we had the game a day or two, not even, you know, and so John called him and said, hey, is this Buck? Because that's what it said, call and ask for Buck. And the guy on the other end is like, no way, you got it already? <laughs> Stealing software isn't as personal as it used to be. No. There's always the issue that, you know, there's no difference between copying a piece of software and walking into a retail store and walking out with the box without paying for it. I mean, 
that's what they always tell you is but it doesn't seem close to home when you do it but you're just a bunch of goofy kids you know and so the software at the time was 39.95 or less and when you're a kid and you don't have any money and you want stuff and it's there and it's free and there's very little to no uh, you know repercussions that could possibly happen to you by you know being the small time software copying uh, there was hundreds of games hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of games and you download a game you, you play it for a while and you throw it away and it, it wasn't even an option that you would have ever bought those I remember thinking to myself who would buy this I remember thought that quite a bit I don't know how you could look at it, you know, and the laws were so goofy at that time that nothing applied, you know, there wasn't really anything too illegal about it, it might have been a copyright violation, but... We never sold any of the stuff we made. That was a rule, we kind of, almost an unwritten rule that we had. You know, Always, never, yeah. never, yeah. never we, there, were, there were pirate groups out there that would get it from us and then try to sell it to their friends. That's we actually, hated that. Yeah, that would be a, that's a sin. I don't think we really realized, I mean, we were fairly young at the time, and it was such an easy thing to do. You know, it wasn't like stealing something at the store and walking out and, you know, thinking I've done something wrong was, oh, I can get a copy of that game just by doing, you know, step ABC. Great, I'll do it because I want to get that game. Nobody ever thinks they're going to get caught or, or, nobody, or nobody would ever commit a crime. You know, you're never going to be the one who gets caught. It's somebody else. So there's some fear of it, but there was also, you know, when you're 15 years old, you pretty much feel that you're invincible. That they can't bust everybody, you know what I mean? And that's sort of everybody's mentality, like they think they're untouchable. We heard rumors of wards being shut down. And it was just rumors because I didn't know anybody personally, I couldn't pick up the phone and call them, that this board was taken down by the sheriff's department last night. My co-system's job was to run fucking hacker all day and get me as many codes as he wants. I didn't want to run it because I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> We were hiding stuff in cereal boxes so that if they went through our trash, they wouldn't find it because it's inside the cereal box. And there was more than one occasion where we were sure we had been busted. Right. You know, they were saying, oh yeah, and you guys are next. They know about you. And we were terrified. And we were kids. We didn't know that they can't come knocking at our door for what we had what we had said, at least at the time. So. Um, and he used to give me all these codes every day. We had a whole system where he'd put the codes into this area in my bulletin board. My bulletin board would use the codes. And then... Uh, one day the police came to his house, they confiscated his computer, his monitor, all his printers, all this stuff. The worst part wasn't that he lost all of his computer stuff because of it. The worst part was that, um, like his parents, you know, I mean, he was 13 and his parents were like, what the hell are you doing? You know? And I remember one night us burning. I mean, we had a, because we lived out in the country, we had a burn barrel. So we went out and we grabbed everything we had. We grabbed all our printouts, mm -hmm. we grabbed everything that was because we had heard one of our friends got busted. And we took it outside, and my parents, they had to have known something was up. Was, you know, 11 o'clock at night, and we're out there burning stuff. And they stolen everything. You know, and I just keep thinking, my parents sitting there reading the book, what are the kids doing? Oh, they're out there burning evidence. What do you think they're doing? And they just didn't need no red flags at all. And, like, we didn't ever think it was a really big deal. And I don't think it was a big deal. I mean, I you know, maybe it was, you know... Twelve dollars worth of calls a week, or something like that. But it was a big enough deal that that when they tried to really crack down on on that kind of thing, they they cracked down on it. You know what we're talking about is stuff that was never told in articles. You know, you could talk about this BBS or that BBS or this person or that person, and about this specific thing. But a lot of people never covered the philosophy behind it or the mentality. And they weren't doing this because it was cool. They were doing it because they didn't have anywhere else to go where people understood them. These were people that they could connect with long distance or medium distance over the phone lines. That was a culture. It was not pretentious. Absolute. It was real. Uh, people were talking about hackers as being these evil little uncontrollable kids who were messing up these established infrastructure systems to the point of anarchy, and anarchy alone. It was focused on like, you know, kids breaking into corporate computer systems, shadowy hackers, you know, there's a bit of sensationalism to it. It wasn't, it wasn't doing the destructive or to steal anything or break things, it was to get in and explore. 
and yet in the media, people were just lambasting hackers as being the, the devil. And it was really, really frustrating. Back then, no one knew what they were doing with, that is the authorities didn't really know what they were doing because, well, like hacking into a computer, well, what kind of crime is that? What did they steal, you know? What being a computer hacker is about is being 15 years old, having an excess of brains and hormones. Um, you know, it's like, it's just basically being a teenager and wanting to like make mischief and learn stuff and, and, and you know, be curious and stuff like that. When you're 15 and 14, you don't have a car, you don't have a girlfriend, you got nothing but time, right? Especially during the summer, no school. So you've literally got, you know, 18 hours a day to just explore, you know? Um, it's, it's like a, you know, t totally fits in with just being a, a, a male teenager. I think that's why you see these kids, 15-year-old kids, you know, in Europe hacking DVDs. I mean, thank God for those kids, right? Because they don't have anything better to do. No car, no girlfriend. That's just what they do. That original period was really unprecedented, you know? I mean, obviously now you can say the current situation of, of the hacker underground is... Uh, it's the evolution of that original time, but that original time was so original it had never been done before. I think it's the first generation of, you know, 13 to 17 year old kids to be so empowered. Because that was the whole point of the bulletin board thing, was to, to find out what the new game was or, you know, or, or you know, that was for me anyway, because all you wanted to do was get the latest and greatest video game, you know, for the Apple II. That was the big reason why bulletin boards existed. My mother, I mean, she passed away two years ago in a car accident, but the last several years that we were talking about it, like the four years previous to that, we started talking about those days because it, I was 13 and the feds were coming by and I didn't, I never wanted to bring it up again, especially when it happened two more times. But she told me later that she thought it was the greatest thing and she would tell all her friends at work how, how smart her son was to break into the Pentagon and do these things and, and uh, be visited upon by the FBI who she never met before. That was the big game. It was a it was a competition to get who could get there first. Yeah, you know whoever could crack it first, you'd have your name up in lights. Twenty years later, now <laughs> we're getting it in lights. But you know, here's the lights. <laughs> By putting out all the knowledge that is discovered, okay, you're going to get more and more people coming in. And sure, 99 out of 100 might be worthless idiots. 999 out of 1,000 may not last as a hacker for a year. Only 1 out of 10,000 may ever make it to a decent hacker status. But you know what? If you're educating millions and millions of 13-year-olds with their first computer, and every night they're over there on their computers trying to hack into this or that, I mean, you have a thing that can never be stopped. Take a million new kids and give them all the information in the world. Let history decide who becomes what.